So my project is about. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So as most of you know, my project is about permafrost. Uh, identifying permafrost for a fossil um, mm -hmm. Click on it. Okay. So first of all, permafrost is soil that's frozen whole year round. And why do we care about foreign permafrost? Permafrost contains a lot of carbon. As you can see on the figure on the left, permafrost contains almost twice as much carbon uh, as in the atmosphere and more than 40% of the carbon in soil. And when permafrost falls, it releases greenhouse gases. The figure on the right, you can see that when permafrost falls, greenhouse you know, gases are released, and those greenhouse gases uh, result in an increase in temperature, causing more permafrost fall. And that's like a cycle that keeps going on. And also when we, we humans would stop with burning fossil fuel, this cycle, this natural cycle is still going on. Um, and currently in the climate negotiations, um, permafrost is not taken fully into account. Because it's very difficult to measure the amount of permafrost um, And therefore, in this study, we are looking at a way of uh, measuring per, uh, permafrost and its resulting greenhouse gases. We are doing, doing this by looking at fast lumps. Fast lumps are distinct landforms in the Arctic that's caused by permafrost and this is one picture of a fast lump. As you can see, it's like it's almost like a crater. Um, and when when permafrost falls, then you get this this crater. And when more and more far happens, also water uh, will go into the crater and you get the permafrost lake. So this study is uh, the goal of the study is to identify those fast lumps using satellite Im imagery across the Arctic. In my study, I have 41 multidimensional images, <coughs> um, and they contain of uh, a label and then an input. And my labels are 1,250 fossil and polygons gathered by the Alfred Wegener Institute, uh, Marine Polar Institute in Germany. Um, and my input, input has satellites, uh, Sentinel spectral bands, uh, Sentinel 2, 10 meter resolution, and elevation data gathered by uh, Google Earth Engine. Uh, yeah, so 41 multidimensional images, and they're from uh, six Arctic sites. Actually, there are four. Um, some are very close to each other, but 10 by 10 kilometers in Canada and in Russia. And they're gathered from different dates in the summer of 2018 and 2019. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, on the, uh, on the left, you can see here the Russian sites and here are the Canadian. Um, uh, and there's chosen for the summer because in the other uh, seasons there's too much snow and ice that makes it very difficult for a model to be able to uh, in identify something. And during the summer school, summer school have access to additional uh, data, and this is weak data because it's gathered by students, so it's not like the same data I had before, where people actually went to the Arctic and gathered their like validated and very accurate uh, polygons. But this is scattered using Google Earth Engine, where students just like <clears throat> identify a lot of fast lumps. So it's less accurate than the Peldega data. Uh, but there are 27 images across five new sites, and they're all in Russia. Um, and in this study, I also, in, in this from the summer school, I, I use those uh, sources as well, just to see if a model would perform better and generalize better if I would add more data and like a weak data. As in the right, you can see an example picture of Turkey on Russia. Uh, the largest problem I have are the differences across sites. Uh, those are my like four sites, my main sites. And as you can see, there are a lot of differences. Uh, first of all, in the image quality, the color contrast, the satellite angle, the light reflection, but also the landscape. Of course, the vegetation, the terrain, so there are mountain, mountains, snow and ice. And the water bodies, uh, like the, the ocean and here lakes, Lilena is a, is a delta or river, so there's a lot of uh, water. It makes it very diff difficult for a model to generalize between those sites. And especially as well, also the fast lumps, the things I want to detect also look different across the sites. And that makes it very difficult. On the left, you can see fast lumps formed uh, in, in Horton. On the right, you can see Lilena in Russia. 
And here the fossil homes look more like, like a rock, room brown, and here it's more white. <clears throat> so it's difficult because this almond in like in Hordon, uh, the snow in Hordon looks very similar to the fossil homes in Lena. So to make a model that can mm -hmm. detect fossil homes in both sides is a very difficult task. And next to this, I also have another problem is that the huge data imbalance. Uh, and it's like two, more than three times more than negatives than positive pixels. So negatives are the pixels, there are no fossil lump, and positive are the fossil lump pixels. Um, and the solution, the first is class fading. So in the loss function, put more focus on the positive pixels and the negative <coughs> pixels. That resulted already like in a good performance uh, um, boost. And then another thing I've done during the summer school is chopping my images into tiles. So this is like one side. And I would uh, chop them up in four uh, tiles and would only select the tiles with the most fossil homes. So then in this case, I would select those two. Uh, and in that case, I would only select the, those three. But still, which you can see as well in this picture, is that there between sides, there's a, also a big imbalance. Like on the right, there are only like a couple of fossil homes. And on the left, there are a lot of fossil homes. So that's still difficult. Like now I select like three, but there are still a lot of neg negatives. So it's not the Perfect solution, but in this case, like uh, I also I still also want to want to keep like that site because that is the site that has a lot of images in my data, data set. But I, at the end, after selecting the positive tiles, I um, uh, had half of my data set left. And then my train validation and test fit, I performed regional cross validation. That's because what I said before. I want the model that generalizes between those sites. So I want to be able to test if a model is performing uh, on unseen sites uh, and if it's like a generalized model. So therefore I'm uh, training four models, <coughs> one per site. So for the model, I leave one side out and that's only for the test set. You can, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, it's only for the test set and the other three sites are used, are used in the training set and in the validation set. And additionally, my uh, the weak sites from the unvalidated data, they are used in the training only, so not in the validation. Then in the development of the model, uh, like most of you have used cloud computing in Microsoft uh, Azure, I've implemented a unit in PyTorch, and my code base was Torch Geo and uh, PyTorch unit for the, for the unit. Uh, and then Torch Geo, that's a satellite code base uh, where the, the best thing I had was that they have like a random random tiling. So I put I give it a large image and they randomly see select in a data loader an image by 64 by 64. Uh, but I had a lot of struggle as well with for it was a was a was a really good find. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure who the winner is, but <laughs> <laughs> then um, a problem I I had and I, I did it yesterday was normalization. Um, <coughs> my a large image values <coughs> ranging between zero and twelve thousand. <coughs> so <coughs> I put here there's some I, I did several normalization techniques, bring the values down between zero and one, and also to remove outliers. So I can quickly go through the steps. This is my original distribution where you can see that I have very like a uh, large values and also outliers, then I normalize them to zero, but still have the outliers. So I clamp them. Uh, that means that all the values larger than one are put to one and all the values lower than minus one are put to minus one. <coughs> and then at the end, I scale them between zero and one. So I have a distribution between zero and one. And then you can see like on the right, you see the picture is corresponding to that normalization uh, step, and at the end, I get like, an, like a nice looking RGB image. Um, so, yeah, my current results are surprisingly bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's what made the, the training I want score 0 0.3. It's worse than a previous model I've trained on TensorFlow. So, I think you have to look more into the code and have to be more boxed than like the normalization thing. So mm -hmm. I think it's just like, uh, or tuning uh, hyperparameters mm -hmm. or looking at my, my code. And what I just finished did yesterday, the normalization, there's still a lot of bugs I think I, I, need, yeah, I need to fix. However, I have very much new insights in my data and I have learned a lot. Uh, yeah, finding a code base, especially Torchio, I think I've really learned a lot <laughs> how to uh, handle such a 
code base and also to look more at my data in the whole process of before but also doing um the training steps always looking at your data and seeing uh, what your code is doing with data i think that's my biggest takeaway uh, and i have a lot of improvement plans for the future for the project so uh, yeah what's next first planet data uh, of course the summer school got access to uh, planet data and planet is a higher resolution satellite data that's three meters instead of 10 meters and i think it will be a big um boost to my project because uh, the average fall of permafrost fast lumps in Canada is between seven mm. and 26 meters a year. And with Sentinel 2 uh, satellite, satellite data, what I'm using now, that will mean like two pixels max a year. Um, so with Planet, I can, I, can, that's a, I can increase that to uh, yeah, more pixels. So it would be great to, I think, to implement Planet. Uh, data uh, and then I was thinking about the same supervised approach maybe in the future to let the model predict new sites and then those results uh, like valid, let them validate by by uh, experts um, but then also the model has to needs to have like a certain baseline like model this this moment I don't think is suitable for that but it could a good it could be a good way of incorporating more data across the whole Arctic to the model uh, and also with new data, I think it's good to focus on, on hard new sites. So really look at which site is like not represented in your in, in the current data set. So in terms of landscape, to really look at the, the outliers of the Arctic region and to or maybe uh, make a model like per, per region. Because it's such a large region, it's good to focus maybe on like one certain uh, reg uh, region. <coughs> um, and then I think um, um, also in, I had that result, but still my model performed better when I was using the student data, so the weak data. So I think for the future, it'd be great to incorporate more of that weak data. And uh, yeah, that seems, seems promising. Uh, so yeah, that, that was like, I think, the, the plans for the future. So I want to thank you all for the amazing summer school and thank the instructors for all the help. and. Uh, that was my presentation. Uh. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, cool. Hey, um, great project, Felix. It's been really cool seeing your projects grow over the course of this school. Um, I'm curious to hear your experience in working between TensorFlow and PyTorch. Mm -hmm. If you had any, like, advice or thoughts on transitioning the project from TensorFlow to PyTorch? Lesson for you. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think my, the biggest uh, for the difficulty I had with TensorFlow to PyTorch is that PyTorch uses a data loader. Mm -hmm. And in terms of like tiling or the, my data, it's, it's more complex because you really need to adjust the data loader. Uh, but I think the overall sort of working of the uh, of the model and easy, you can easily more easily access the model and think also like look at your at the images in PyTorch. So I think overall, it, I'm, I think it's nicer to use PyTorch. But it's it's for me was well, a bit of a, a le learning curve. Um, I think it has some aspects. I think TensorFlow is maybe easier um, than PyTorch. But I think overall, I feel like if for next new project, if I were to choose, I think I would choose for for PyTorch. But with um with your original system, you did all the tiling sort of ahead of time, yeah. and then ran it through TensorFlow. Like yeah. If you'd chosen to do that instead of, I think it made a lot of sense to try to use the random data. Yeah. Loop, but actually, like that, just going from the images you'd already tiled and running them through PyTorch probably wouldn't have been so comfortable. Mm, that's good. Yeah, that's that's true. But yeah. like the the difference before, I just I randomly tiled it before, so like 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 every tile would always be the same. So just like chop them up before, and now in this current approach, it's a random tiler by this Torchio code database, who's like randomly selecting a tile. So in like theoretically, this would be a better approach because you're always like selecting random tiles, you know, like a fixed. Thing. I also think that that's probably why your training F1 was so much higher before because mm -hmm. it was seeing the exact same fixed images every time, so it had memorized them more. That's easily. yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, one thing you could do is you could actually try using PyTorch with that ex those exact yeah. same images and see yeah. and compare it more directly. Yeah. Yeah. 
other questions? Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, just wondering, you said that the snow looked quite similar to these slumps sometimes. Mm -hmm. Have you considered maybe using one of these derived metrics, like a normalized different snow index or something, as like one of these synthetic bands in your TIFFs to kind of like help it learn, you know, because everyone's like, oh, if it's over one or something, I know this is snow, uh, just to have some way to differentiate it from, from the land. I haven't thought about that. But then you would like search for some white values, you would like, what would you exactly mean by? So like, just like a, an NDVI index, except for snow, basically, like, you know, it's been used for a long mm -hmm. time. Instead of having like RGB and ERIR, mm -hmm. kind of just stacking it on. So you have like a five band raster instead of uh -huh. a four band raster. Um, I've seen people do this in like Kaggle competitions mm -hmm. for, you know, there's a water one in WI that might have yeah. it up too. I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure if then like the, my fall slums would also be identified as snow. Yeah. Because they're looking so similar then. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's tricky because like when we're looking at satellite imagery, right, we're look, visualizing in three bands, but there's like all this yeah, other stuff. Yeah. So like NDSI has been used as like an automated metric of just like thresholding and saying like, oh, this is clearly snow. So I don't know, maybe it would yeah. work, but it might be. Yeah, I think it's a good thing to look at, but um, yeah. Cool. Okay, one more question, and then and then maybe the next speaker can come up and start transitioning. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there an association between these thaw slumps and um, like basins of watersheds? Like, do these slumps happen where water pools? Yeah. So, could you like focus on watershed basins to narrow in on them? That's a very good question. Uh, they call permafrost lakes. So, like when a thaw slump like it's longer, like after a period of time, uh, water that uh, causes by by far will go into all those uh, sparse slums and you like get out of those lakes. So indeed, you also could identify those lakes. There's another uh, aspect of identifying for is by looking at the uh, lakes. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much.